here, we're going to start out with a question, as we always do. A nice solid question. Figure A is a glenoid CT 3D reconstruction of a 26-year-old accountant who has recurrent shoulder instability. So let's look at that for a minute. Uh, there is the CT scan. Uh, you can see this is a, a left shoulder, and you're looking on the glenohumeral joint, and you see that that sort of uh, vertical line. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, there was a time when people thought it was a diagonal or 45 degrees, but it's that vertical line or zero degree um, injury as what happens with bone loss. And so let's go back and finish the question. That's what we're thinking about here. His first dislocation occurred after a fall while skiing. He's now sustained his third dislocation, which was reduced in the emergency department prior to being sent to your office. What's the most appropriate definitive treatment? And as you can see at the top of the screen there, the amount of time this question has been asked, uh, this is a very, very uh, common topic to ask about. There's a few things. 26-year-old male, uh, again, high incidence of recurrence. Bone injury, high incidence of recurrence. Traumatic event, high incidence of recurrence. And now he's had three dislocations, which means uh, uh, conservative management has not been successful. So do you immobilize in an external rotation for six weeks? Not going to make a difference. Arthroscopic bony banker repair, arthroscopic remplissage, glenoid augmentation using coracoid transfer, such as a ladder J, or glenoid augmentation using a tricortical graft. And uh, so we'll look at it one more time. So what would you do? And the answer is arthroscopic banco repair. Patient has recurrent anterior instability. The bone defect, you can see there, though we didn't measure it specifically, but it's less than 15%. Uh, there is some controversy on what that number is, as Matt already brought up, but 10 to 15% is sort of the watershed number. Uh, and if you go more than uh, 15 to 20%, you really ought to be thinking more along the lines of a bone procedure if their bone is missing or, or atrophic. So we're going to talk about this a little bit more. The most definitive uh, management in this patient would be an arthroscopic bony bank art repair. There's a couple of other answers of the, the arthroscopic remplissage. We didn't see the humeral head. We don't know what the hill sax lesion is like. So that wasn't the right answer for this question. Glenoid augmentation using a coracoid transfer, quite honestly, uh, in some parts of the world, uh, in some parts of Europe, that might have been the correct answer, even for this small amount of bone loss in many surgeons' hands. Uh, but uh, the most common answer you see there, two out of three, is going to be towards an arthroscopic bony bank art repair. Um, so that's what we do for this procedure. So TUBS, which stands for Traumatic Unidirectional instability with the bank art lesion was a was a term that was coined by Dr. Rick Matson, and he he wanted to set up this idea of instability that there was this one type where there was a traumatic event it was in one direction there was a labral bony injury and surgery was very effective and the other end of the spectrum was the ambry that Matt brought up the atraumatic multidirectional bilateral and the point there was that, generally speaking, that surgery is not as effective. It's more of a rehabilitation program. We know that there's a very broad spectrum in between the two, uh, but the point is, is that he wanted to really focus on these different types. And the one we're talking about is the one which is very clearly defined. It's a traumatic event. It's typically unidirectional, although some of our athletes, as you'll see here in this video, uh, can have severe enough injuries that can be bidirectional. So watch this abduction, external rotation event, and boom, he hits his arm, and we can guess what happened. His humeral head came out the front. His labrum was torn. He may have had a significant bone injury. He may even have a significant hill sax lesion, and sometimes these are so severe, they even get a rotator cuff tear. So it's uh, what you see here, the epidemiology, uh, almost 2% in the general population. Um, and up to 80 to 90 percent of this occurs in teenagers, and that if it does happen in a teenager, uh, then uh, excuse me, the recurrence rate is very, very high. The most, the highest recurrence rate typically is males under the age of 30. If you go into the teenagers, uh, the recurrence rate is even more significant, 90 percent or more. So um, it's a real problem uh, to manage this. And again, the mechanism is when the shoulder is abducted and externally rotated in a forceful direction. The associated injuries or, or lesions that occur, as you see in the slide, the bank art lesion is typically described as the labrum pulled off the rim on a right shoulder, looking at the glenoid as the face of a clock. The key zone of injury is from the 3 to the 6 o'clock position. 
but the humeral head actually comes out around the 4 to 4.30 position, so that zone of injury can go above the 3 o'clock position, and it can go around past the 6 o'clock position, which we see quite commonly in our collision athletes and the higher energy type injuries. Uh, it's considered, the banker lesion is considered an avulsion of the labrum and the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, again, with extension of that lesion, both superiorly and inferiorly posteriorly. Um, it occurs in patients, uh, the, the humeral avulsions, um, this is a, actually you see on the slide there, so if I use my little uh, pointer to show you that, when there is, you're looking at this view of an MRI, a coronal view, and you see there's a displacement of the capsule far below where it should normally attach inferiorly on the humeral neck. Uh, this is consistent with a disruption of the ligaments going to the humerus or what's known as a humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligaments. It's, uh, tested, it's suggested slightly older than those with bank art lesions, but you can see this in your younger patients too, so you, you have to pay attention to this. Uh, this can be a cause of failure if it's poorly recognized, um, so you need to be able to fix it. It's most commonly repaired with an open surgical approach, uh, but we have described a technique uh, as others have, but uh, one of the techniques we use, we use arthroscopic techniques to do this. Uh, you have to be very careful because the axillary nerve, but these can be repaired routinely with arthroscopic uh, techniques in 2017. Uh, so that's a possibility uh, for these individuals. And with the other things that we can see is these glenohumeral labral articular defects. Where I see this in my practice most commonly is in the posterior labral tears in our football players and rugby players. So when they go to do a blocking mechanism, they put their hands out front and their shoulder gets driven back. They tear off the labrum, but they often shear off part of the glenoid articular cartilage back in there. It can occur anteriorly too, uh, but we see this quite regularly at that posterior inferior aspect of the shoulder in our big linemen and linebackers playing American football. And then the other one is this anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion. And sorry to throw this alphabet soup at you, but each one of these has been described as having a certain characteristic to it, the Alps lesion in particular is one where it peels off that front edge, and why that's important is because typically the bone loss is more than is easily recognized, and so they actually turn out to be bad actors, and there's a number of papers that shown uh, that while you may think this is not such a bad thing, the surgical results are not as good and the recurrence rates are higher, so you want to pay attention for, for those when that periosteal sleeve is pulled off and it's all the way down the neck. Uh, I think the key thing to do in that situation is you really have to free up that soft tissue. You can't just accept it where it lies. You have to free up the whole thing and move it all the way back where it belongs, and then you have a good chance of success with arthroscopic management. These bony bank art lesions can occur. Um, they can be present. Uh, uh, it says here that the, a fracture of this area can be present up to 50%, and there's some work by Sugaya and our Japanese colleagues that it can be up to 50%, and, and 40% of the bony lesions can be attritional kind of wear and tear lesions, so after this occurs and it's healed, they can go on and have more and more wear and tear. These acute bony lesions, if they're displaced, especially if they're depressed, they don't do very well. There is some evidence from Europe if they're fractured, but they line up perfectly well, especially in patients over the age of 30, the non-operative management can be a reasonable course of action. But this fracture here in a relatively active patient would be uh, a reason to fix that, to align that more correctly. And again, the hill Sachs defect, Hill and Sachs were two radiologists at the University of California, San Francisco back in the 40s before MRI and CT scan who said, you know what, when you see that dent in the back of the humerus, the only way that happens is when the humerus comes out the front. And so they get the credit for getting uh, that lesion recognized as a as a, a sentinel finding of anterior dislocation of the shoulder. And then, of course, we've now later termed the uh, reverse hill sax lesion when it goes out the back. And it's a chondral impaction lesion uh, that occurs when it slips out the front. And it can occur up to 80% of the traumatic injuries uh, from traumatic dislocation. So um, it's noted here on the slide it's not significant unless it engages the glenoid. I think we're learning more and more about those. Matt has some really good work that's been done on that. When it's a combined glenoid lesion and a combined hill sax lesion, even though they're two small lesions, they can have an additive effect. So in general, we pay most attention to the glenoid side, but we are paying more and more attention to understanding when the humeral side and the hill sax lesion is very important. 
So um, in terms of the uh, traumatic anterior shoulder instability, again, the associated injuries, you can get greater tuberosity fractures when these dislocate. Um, you can get lesser tuberosity fractures when they go out the back. These are less common, usually in older patients. But what you can also get, as Matt talked about, the luxio erecta, which can be a form of this, although I know it goes out inferiorly, is it can actually almost tomahawk off the rotator cuff. And these individuals can get a rotator cuff tear, not just a, a, a injury to the actual tu <coughs> <coughs> to the tuberosity. So um, the other things that can happen is you can imagine, this goes out the front. I'm choking up because this is so important to me. Sorry about that. <laughs> Just a quick sip of water here. Sorry about that. So um, other things that can happen when the humeral head comes out the front, obviously the axillary nerve can be stretched or injured. It's been noted to be up to 5% of patients. We usually treat that non-operatively. And as I mentioned here, rotator cuff tears are not very common under the age of 40, but a dislocation of the shoulder at 40 years old and older is an indication to evaluate and frequently image the rotator cuff because the incidence of rotator cuff injuries are so high. So it's very important that you understand that risk factor. Here's another good question. 24-year-old male gymnast is scheduled for arthroscopic pair of the right shoulder. His preoperative MRI is seen in figure A. Let's look at it real quick. Here it is. And I think you've got a pretty good idea what we're looking at there. And initial arthroscopic exam as viewed from the anterior portal in the lateral decubitus position is demonstrated in B. And so you see the HH as the humeral head, and you see this area where you can see muscle fibers through the capsule. So this is a tear in the capsule related to uh, the humeral attachment. Based on these images, which of the following diagnosis is correct? So partial articular sided cuff tear, it's in the wrong spot. Alps lesion, no, that's the glenoid side. Hagel lesion, that's our answer. And then the glenoid labral articular defect, no. And then, of course, the superior. So just work through that. You see this, this is off. Of, you can see that it's off of the, the actual humerus down here. So pay attention to that coronal view on your MRI. And then here's the humeral head, and that's peeled off. And this is a kind of a dangerous area because the axillary nerve is going to be right down in here. And that's the muscle of the subscapularis that we have to deal with with that. So that's an important one to recognize. 24-year-old male gymnast is scheduled for arthroscopic repair of the right shoulder. Preoperative MRI is seen in figure A. Uh, so here we go, figure A. So, oh, this is the one we just talked about. Apologize for that. And uh, the initial exam viewed from there. So the important thing is, is to recognize that these humeral avulsions of the glenohumeral ligament can occur. They're not as common, but when they do occur, they can be a source of failure if they're not recognized and treated. The MRI and arthroscopic images that you saw are consistent with this exam. And um, in cases of posterior instability, you can actually get a tear, a tear off the back, a ragal lesion. And um, as a side note, those ragal lesions have been described more commonly in a sport like rugby. And that's because when they go to hit the ground, the rugby players will often break their fall and put their arm in this position across their body, and they come down on their elbow, and it drives their elbow across their body and out the back. And as it does that, it's enough of a force to actually tear the capsule. So be careful of that kind of mechanism. Fall on the outstretched arm, and the arm goes across the body at a deduction for a ragal lesion. Um, we talked about these uh, stabilizers before, so we're all pretty much up to speed on this. Uh, this is a classification scale that's out there, and we talked about the, the amount of translation, the, the zero, nor, relatively normal. Quite honestly, zero and one are normal. Two is typically can be associated with abnormal if the patient has clinical symptoms. And then the sulcus test, uh, Matt talked to you about that, and we've worked through this pretty well on the basic science part of things. There is this uh, instability severity score uh, that was developed by Pascal Boileau from Nice, France. And um, it talks about uh, problems related to the shoulder. Um, it has been evaluated and assessed. It's from 2007, so it's more than a decade old. It is a helpful way to sort of think about the factors that are related to recurrence, such as age uh, under 20, degree of sports participation, the type of sports participation, shoulder hyperlaxity, heel sacs, and glittery contour. The problem is, is that there is uh, some controversy because a young man that plays football that walks into your office under the age of 20, 
uh, basically has such a, a bad score that he's going to get a bony reconstruction, whether or not he has a bony problem or not. And many people around the world don't agree with that, particularly in the United States. And so we address problems when they have a bone lesion. We address the bone lesion and the the in, the insecurity instability severity index score may be helpful for that. Uh, but um, when they don't have a bone lesion, most people are still using arthroscopic techniques to resolve this condition. Um, and again, here is a uh, it was less than six points was an acceptable risk. Uh, with 10% arthroscopic stabilization. He, uh, Dr. Boileau, or Professor Boileau, has actually subsequently revised that and basically says that any that he wants it down to three. So again, anything over a three, uh, he would do a Latterge or bone reconstruction. And that's, not, uh, that's a controversial subject and not what we typically do in the United States uh, for our athletes or patients. Um, the symptoms, uh, you know, the feeling of instability or apprehension, uh, shoulder pain can accompany this, but uh, usually when their arm is at rest after they've been over the initial event, they don't have a whole lot of pain. The physical exam we went over, most of us use some form of the apprehension sign as our guide. If we do that test and it reproduces their symptoms, that's very helpful. The relocation sign is one that's also quite helpful. And then we look for these other things like general ligamentous laxity, as Matt talked to you about. Radiographic studies are very important. We all get at least two x-rays, so a true AP of the glenohumeral joint and an axillary lateral. Most people then will supplement that with a third scapular Y view because you can see tuberosities and other things like that. You can improve some of the views by internal and external rotation. Uh, but in addition to that, when you're trying to look at the anterior inferior glenoid rim for anterior instability, the West Point view is a very nice view. The Stryker view is a very nice view, and it's not on here. Uh, but there's a, a, another view uh, that is done frequently um, in, in Europe, and, uh, and that's a, a view where you can actually see this in profile uh, looking across the, the uh, glenoid, and that's a, um, a very, very nice uh, uh, view that we use also uh, at, at times. So here is just a, a view that you see here, sort of the striker notch view. There's another view, the, uh, the axillary lateral view. And then here's those views that we can see in profile, uh, which are very nice uh, views to see uh, when uh, there's been an injury to the bone. And then, of course, in 2017, the gold standard for clearly identifying bone loss is a 3D CT scan. Now, a CT scan may be the answer on a question, and this is, as you can see, is asked a lot. Um, but if there's a difference between a 2D and a 3D, there is literature to suggest the 3D CT scan provides a better analysis of the bone loss because you can orient the scapula and the face of the glenoid so you can identify this very carefully. Certainly, a CT scan is better than plain x-rays, but a 3D CT scan is the highest level that we use at this time when evaluating bone loss for instability. And here's just an example of how we can see this very nicely. Here's just another example, seeing that uh, off the front of, the, of this here. And uh, the view that uh, is the uh, French radiologist view is called the Bergenet view. And that view is, again, it almost looks like the CT scan because you see the glenoid in profile with the humeral head sitting over the top of that. Here's a good question. 25-year-old basketball play player sustains an anterior shoulder dislocation during a game that is subsequently reduced with traction. The MRI will most likely show which of the following. And so supraspinatus tear, probably not. Humeral avulsion, not as likely. Long head of the biceps tear, no. Superior labrum tear, anterior inferior labral tear. So that's a pretty straightforward one. Acute traumatic anterior dislocation. And the answer is anterior inferior labral tear. The MRI is very, very valuable for looking at soft tissues. Again, in 2017, bony anatomy, CT, 3D CT scan. If you're looking for soft tissue issues, at this time, the MRI is the best. I think those things are going to come together. We've done some studies to show that 
Uh, you can actually do 3D MRI scans, and you can look at the bone the same way as the CT. So that's coming, but that's down the road in a few years uh, when our computers and our software systems will work more effectively. But when you really want to look at the soft tissue, so for example, on this axillary view, and you're trying to see all the different things here, you can see the anterior labrum. Here's the coracoid process here. You can see the subscapularis attaching. You, you can see the posterior labrum. Uh, you can see the capsule. So this gives you tremendous view, and you can see the muscles of the infraspinatus and the subscapularis. So the MRI gives you a tremendous amount of information that helps us in treating our patients. Here's another view, uh, and this is a more indicative of a patient who's had a dislocation. So you see that the anterior labrum is off in this region. You also see the evidence of an impaction fracture or lesion or the hill sacs lesion posteriorly this area. The subscapularis is intact, and you notice that the overall width of the glenoid has been reduced up front. They have that same kind of injury we saw on those 3D CT scans up front. Here's another example showing a very nice hill sacs lesion, and this is one uh, where this is a probably symptomatic. And in fact, this one here is indicative of the luxio erecta that Matt Preventure talked about before. The arm goes in abduction, and you can see you've torn the capsule inferiorly, you have some blunting of the inferior glenoid, and a big lesion in the humeral head. This is going to be a really tough case to manage because of all the, the, the injury that occurs with this. Here's another one with, of course, with the Hagel lesion that we've been talking about. Non-operative management. Um, uh, management of first-time dislocators uh, remains controversial, but the majority of people are treated non-operatively. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. If you have a person who dislocates their shoulder the first time and has no other events and you operate on them and doesn't go well, that was a problem that you created. If the patients had multiple dislocations and you operate on them and it doesn't go perfectly, they seem to understand the complexity and diversity of their problem and there's a shared decision making that's much more uh, better, it's much better with regards to communication and how you develop that patient-physician relationship. So there are some exceptions. Our high-level athletes, we treat those right away. People where their shoulder stability is basically could be life-threatening if it wasn't that way. But there's controversy if you just fix everybody. But the majority of people will give a course of non-operative management, see how the patients do. If it keeps coming out, we know there's increased injury and you have to um, have to go in before there's a lot of cartilage and bone injury. There is some studies that show that immobilization and external rotation decreases recurrence rates. E.G. Itoi from Sendai, uh, Japan, put together a very nice study. I think culturally you can imagine the Japanese people were willing to wear uh, these braces in abduction and external rotation for four to six weeks. Uh, those studies have been repeated in other cultures, including the U.S. and Canada, and we haven't seen the same success rate. So I don't know anyone that does that at this time, putting the arm in abduction, external rotation, and holding it there for a period of time. So I think that's been fairly well refuted in, in terms of other cultures and how well that works. Um, Non-operative management, uh, we try to reduce the shoulder, of course. We immobilize for a short period of time, and it's followed by physical therapy to strengthen those dynamic stabilizers. And this is just uh, an example, uh, just putting together the external rotators and internal rotators of the shoulder. Um, it's just a small animation that just shows how these work. And this is your external rotation, so your posterior deltoid, your latissimus plays a role, your teres uh, plays a role in terms of managing these things. And so we'll go on to the next question. A 38-year-old former professional football player um, and, uh, complains of long-standing left shoulder pain. He admits to multiple previous shoulder dislocations in the past, which were treated conservatively with physical therapy. Now he's complaining of repetitive instability and a catching feeling whenever he abducts his arm and externally rotates his arm. Physical exam, he has a positive apprehension test, crepitation in the 90-90 position. That's the throwing position. A current MRI image of his shoulder is seen in figure A. So let's look at that. Here it is. So that's the one that we looked at before. We kind of already talked about that a little bit. So which of the following surgical treatments is most appropriate to address his symptoms? And again, this is, again, he's a 38-year-old former player. His bone loss is questionable. And in today's environment, if we are really assessing this well, we would probably get a 3D CT scan to look at his glenoid. And we would get, so we'd really want to know how much bone is off here, because that's at least 10%, especially when you look back here. And we'd want to know how much is here. 
And in fact, since this lesion is large enough, there's a concept that we haven't talked about, but when the humerus goes out the front, if this defect is larger than the width of the glenoid, that is an off-track lesion. So when this lesion comes out here, when the lesion comes out here more towards the articular surface, and when you go to externally rotate and it comes over the rim, that's off-track lesion. Those are bad actors. They have a high recurrence rate. If there's a lesion that's closer to the rotator cuff, and when you externally rotate and it does not come over the edge, that's an on-track lesion, and those patients do better. You really need better imaging of the bone, which is a 3D CT scan, to figure that all out. But for the purposes of this question, which would be a typical question you see asked quite frequently, what would be most appropriate? You can figure this out by the answer. So superior labor repair, no. Open approach for bone grafting of the humeral defect with allograft, no. That wouldn't be a first-line management. Open repair of the humeral avulsion, the glenohumeral ligament lesion, REM plissage, arthroscopic banker, and REM plissage. So I think you get the hint here, and you're going to treat both lesions. So this is consistent with a bank art tear and engaging hill sacs in the 90-90 position. And so it was a, probably an off-track lesion once figured out. And one of the treatments is an arthroscopic uh, procedure, a bank art repair, and a REM plissage. And again, this is controversial, but in some parts of the world, that patient would be offered and treated with the latter J procedure because you fix that glenoid bone defect and you essentially create an on-track lesion and you can leave the hill sacs lesion alone. And that at some point may become a comparatively fair question to ask on these examinations, but in today, 2017, we'll stay with the arthroscopic bank art and REM plissage procedure. Now, the procedure, the surgical procedure, as you see here, is fairly well described. Um, the indications, first time traumatic in the right athlete or worker uh, with a bank art lesion. Athletes younger, it says 25, but really under the age of 30, the recurrence rates are quite high and high demand athletes. And what you'll see on our little uh, drawing here is you want to start very, very low at that six o'clock position. In fact, we've learned, uh, you know, this, this view here is actually for a posterior labrum. I didn't pick that up, but this is actually, we should be fixing it up here in the front part of the shoulder. Uh, so that's a mistake in our drawing here. We'll get that corrected, but it should be because the biceps is going out the front. This is the coracoid. And so it should be from the, this position, but starting down low and proceeding up and then including a posterior inferior uh, type uh, suture when needed when there is a significant lesion back there. And there's plenty of evidence we've recently published. If you do this in the lateral position, you use three or more anchors and you use anchors with sutures, your recurrence rate is about 7%. And it's as good as any type of open procedure with soft tissue repair. The recurrence rates are slightly lower with the latter J procedure, but in the published literature that's out there, the complication rate is higher. So that's part of the controversies that we run with. Um, the uh, approach, uh, it's very important to, to be able to see all these things. People do this in both the beach chair and the lateral position. You, I believe that you see better the inferior aspect of the glenohumeral joint in the lateral position, in a position as Matt talked to you about. When we looked at published papers of lateral versus beach chair, there was a statistically significant higher risk of recurrence in those papers published by uh, people that did this in the beach chair position. And I think really uh, it's because of unrecognized soft tissue injury down in that area. But if you're asked the question, what is the reason for recurrence after an arthroscopic bank art repair, the most common one is unrecognized bone loss. So that needs to be evaluated ahead of time. 22-year-old collegiate football player has immediate onset of left shoulder pain after a tackle. He reports a history of multiple subluxation in the past. This is the first time that he had a pop. Uh, he had to pop his shoulder back into place. On exam three days later, he has weakness in the deltoid. So we know what's going on there. CT axial exam uh, is displayed in figure A. Let's just look at that. So that's a that's a not only is that a bony bank art, but it's a displaced bony bank art. And this is at least 25%. Interestingly, we don't see on this view a significant hill sax lesion, but he really uh, has a significant lesion to his glenoid. Which of the following is the most appropriate uh, step in the management? And it's a bony bank art lesion stabilization. The clinical presentation is consistent with that. And most appropriately, uh, these lesions are, are important to, to understand how to manage this. And in fact, if you're going to arthroscopically treat this, you have to be comfortable with putting an anchor 
right below or medial to this fragment. If you try to fix this fragment with your normal suture anchor technique here, what's going to do is it's just going to tilt the whole thing and you're going to have a defect here just like this. You're going to fix it the way this is laying right here and you don't want that. So you have to have a strategy, either a double row strategy or another strategy. I personally like to put um, anchor one or two medial and bring them over the top and fix them, and that'll hold that fragment in place. Uh, we had a professional baseball player on our team, and I had exactly this lesion when he fell on his shoulder, and we fixed him, and in four months he was back to playing professional baseball. It was his glove hand or his non-throwing hand, uh, but these bone fragments heal very quickly, and they can return back to sport and activities at a relatively rapid rate. And so we talked about that. A bank art lesion with glenoid bone loss less than 20% um, maybe is a good indication for open repair. Again, if you look carefully at the literature and you do more than 10 to 11 year follow-up and a systematic review that we conducted, you'll see that the recurrence rates are about the same, 7 8% open versus arthroscopic. But some people believe in the collision athlete uh, that, uh, you know, that may be something. So uh, I personally uh, don't... Uh, do open repairs anymore, but there are some very talented surgeons, and if that's the way you do it best, you should do it open, uh, whatever's best in your hands. But I think we can manage these arthroscopically. What we can't manage is that bone loss. We can also manage humeral avulsion of glenohumeral ligaments arthroscopically, but I would say the majority of surgeons uh, don't actually uh, do that. Um, and then um, an open approach is through the anterior approach. Most people use a, an axillary incision straight up and down, but you can go deltal pectoral. Uh, most surgeons now have diverted away from peeling off the subscapularis and instead doing a subscapularis split. That's what we do when we do our coracoid transfers like a ladder J. Um, and we try to be very careful about hurting the two nerves that we have to address anteriorly. One is the axillary nerve laying over the front of the subscapularis, but the other is the musculocutaneous nerve, which is buried inside of the biceps and uh, the short head of the biceps and coracal brachialis. So you have to be careful over there underneath the coracoid. Um, complications, Matt mentioned that before a little bit too, so subscapularis injury or failed repair, uh, this is a, a not an uncommon question, you'll hear about someone having surgery and then they're having persistent discomfort, their shoulder doesn't work as well, and then they'll give you something like physical exam test shows a positive liftoff test and a positive belly press test, and so you know their subscapularis is injured and not doing well. And that may happen up to 20% of individuals that have a the subscapular is completely cut off, may lose one or two grades of their muscle uh, in terms of the overall uh, size of the muscle or the atrophy. So we try to split instead of take them down. Axillary nerve injury and, of course, late arthritis, usually associated with a restrictive loss of external rotation. 30-year-old man undergoes an arthroscopic bank art repair for recurrent anterior dislocation. He continues to experience instability postoperatively, even though he had a repair. Exam reveals a positive apprehension test, so he has recurrent anterior instability. Radiographs of both shoulders are seen in figure A, and a CT scan of his left shoulder is seen in figure B. So let's take a look at that. So this is the version A view here that you see here where you see it almost like a pedestal like this and what you can see you can see how this is basically tomahawked off that front rim and then on the right side you see this and of course we see this bony lesion we've seen a couple of times here and uh, so one of the procedures that would be helpful is a, a coracoid um, autograph. Uh, looking at the different rem plissage, that's for heel sacs, that's not the right answer. Humeral head bone augmentation, that's not the right answer. Bank out repair, that would be a very challenging surgical repair. Some surgeons might accomplish that. A coracoid autograft may be the most reliable procedure when there's disruption of the bone, it's fragmented, and you may not be able to do that. So if you're going to attack this, trying to fix this uh, arthroscopically, and you're sort of investigationally moving along those lines, that's fine, but you should make sure you're capable of converting to a coracoid transfer. The latter J is the standard of care for bone loss on the glenoid side in 2017. The variation of the latter J is the Bristol procedure where just the tip of the coracoid is taken off, and that operation is used by some surgeons, particularly with arthroscopic techniques in Europe, uh, less commonly in the United States. And we typically talk about bone deficiencies of 20%. I think that's what you'll get on the exam. We've learned that in our younger patient population, that number probably should be adjusted down to about 15%. JT Tokish had a paper where 13% in the military was much higher risk of recurrence. So uh, it's something we have to pay careful attention to because uh, that'll gradually change. 13%. 
can you imagine? We're talking about three millimeters on the average glenoid. The difference between two millimeters and three millimeters and four millimeters, no wonder it's a little hard to figure that out. That's a very small amount of bone, and it makes a big difference on whether these patients stay stable or not. Uh, the operation is an anterior approach, again, through the deltal pector interval. The latter is eight. Usually, we try to get two centimeters or more of the coracoid, and the classic example is just to flip the coracoid down. So we take the coracoid and rotate it down and put two screws in place. And if you're looking at a right shoulder, as you see on the graph below, it's typically from the 2 o'clock down to about the 5 o'clock position. That's where you want to place this. A Bristow procedure is half of that, and typically you put that from about the 3 to 4 or 4.30 position uh, if you're going to do that type of procedure. And since the musculocutaneous nerve goes along with the short head of the biceps and coracobrachialis, you have to be careful about that. Iliac crest graft is a, is a backup graft. Uh, in Germany and Austria, it actually is a very common operation. Instead of doing a ladder J, uh, many of those surgeons prefer to use an iliac crest graft, and some of them do it even without fixation. It's called a J graft reconstruction. Some of them do it arthroscopically. So uh, this is uh, it works very well for the same indications as the ladder J. And then the remplissage is, an, a, is sort of, we, we learned about this. Uh, Gene Wolfe was the first to describe that. Remplissage means to fill. And so what he did is he put sutures in the heel sacs defect and passed them out through the capsule and into the infraspinatus and then tied those sutures. And it filled that defect and found out that this restricted uh, the incidence of falling into that on-track, uh, that, that off-track lesion. And so more surgeons have used this. There's been concerns about loss of external rotation and other things. And to say the least, I think it's a nice adjunct, particularly when that heel sac lesion is between 15 and 25 percent. Uh, but you have to be careful. You don't want to restrict the motion. And um, you have to be comfortable with the operation. It is a significant difference in the typical arthroscopic uh, bank art procedure. So you should learn how to do that in the lab and be instructed in that procedure. A bone graft reconstruction for the hill sacs. Usually, these are the large hill sacs, lesions, more than 25 to 40 percent. We're actually trying to preserve the joint so that you don't have to go on to a shoulder arthroplasty type procedure. And oftentimes, it's a revision case. You fix the anterior glenoid labrum and capsule, and the patient still is engaging, and a hill sacs lesion may be the only uh, thing that's bothering them, and they may have to have something done. Putty plat, Magnuson stack, these are types of capsular plication only for historical purposes. Nobody really does these operations anymore, and I don't really think they're going to ask you any questions about that. The only reason they ask you a question is the putty plat, they would take the anterior capsule and overlap it. And so they had a loss of external rotation, and that was persistent, so they had a high incidence of development of arthritis. And when you have to do a shoulder replacement, they develop a condition called capsulorapy arthropathy, which is a really challenging problem because their loss of external rotation, the humeral head gets pushed out the back, and they get a lot of wear in those B1 and 2, B2 glenoids. So the reason why you want to know about a putty plat is because you want to stay away from that because that can be a real problem. And again, the Boyd cisc is a really from just historical purposes. Here's another question. Which of the following patients has the highest risk of developing recurrent instability after an arthroscopic bank or repair for anterior shoulder instability? So this is trying to test our knowledge with regards to the factors that are associated with um, recurrence after an arthroscopic. And we know that the main one is bone loss, and then age is the second one, and then some other factors play a role, such as ligamentous laxity. So when we look at the question, 30-year-old female, it's a little bit older, recreational soccer, less aggressive, ligamentous laxity, um, some loss of bony contour. So that's possibly, there's some risk factors there. 16-year-old male that plays recreational hockey, there's some concerns there with x-ray showing a loss of glenoid contour. 18-year-old female, competitive tennis player, no laxity, x-ray findings of a heel sac lesion and loss of glenoid contour. So there's bone loss on both the glenoid side and the humeral side, and she's under the age of 20, very high risk of recurrence after arthroscopic bank or repair. 45-year-old male kind of places them out of that higher risk zone. 28-year-old male competitive football player with normal abnormal x-rays, in other words, no bone loss. And so when we put this all together, the best answer for this question is the 18-year-old competitive tennis player with no ligamentous laxities. She didn't get any points off for that. She got it for her age. And then the fact that she has a bone lesion on her humerus, a heel sacs lesion, and a bone lesion on her glenoid. And in Pascal Boileau's series, that type of patient was associated with a 70% recurrence rate after an arthroscopic stabilization. Now, the 
point I want to make about that is the arthroscopic stabilization that was done at that time is not what we do today. And addressing the inferior posterior component of anterior instability would substantially reduce that recurrence rate. So, but this is what's in the published literature and this is what you could be tested on. But I do believe uh, that our current techniques in 2017 that we use uh, can substantially lower this risk. So uh, recurrence is of course a main one, shoulder pain from having surgery, nerve injuries we talked about, and then stiffness, especially loss of external rotation. Infection is very rare, less than 1%, a little bit more common, still less than 1%, but a little bit more common in open surgery like a Latterge. Graft lysis can occur in a Latterge procedure. Oftentimes there's loss of the bone at the superior aspect of the bone, which is really just following Wolf's law as the lower part fills out the overall glenoid. Um, and then hardware complications, that can be a big issue. And then chondral lysis, which uh, was a big issue with thermal surgeries and other things, but uh, we see that at much less now. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.